Check this out! Each zebra has its own unique pattern of stripes, just as people have their own unique fingerprints. Is it just a myth, or is it the truth? What do you think? It's true! Stripes on each zebra form a unique pattern, so it's impossible to find two zebras that are exactly the same. The stylish black and white pattern serves as an optical illusion to confuse and scare away their key enemies – predators and annoying insects such as tsetse flies or horse flies. Zebras are probably aware of how fabulous they are because they take time to groom one another. So if you ever see two zebras standing close to one another, they aren't biting each other, it's a friendly beauty routine. Unlike humans, zebras can't scratch themselves on their own that easily, so they're just pulling loose hairs off each other. I do that. Although zebras live in herds, they usually create smaller family groups – a male, several females, and their offspring. And each member of that group is unique when it comes to their stripe patterns. All bats are blind. Would you buy it? Nah, it's just a myth. Being blind as a bat is a figure of speech, and it comes from the assumption that bats cannot see properly. In ancient times, also known as before the 21st century, people used to think that bats were blind, judging these charismatic creatures by their weird flight patterns. Many bats do use echolocation to navigate, but still, all of them can see. Here comes the next one. Lobsters are monogamous and stay together for a lifetime. True or false, what do you say? Well, sorry to spoil the romance, but it's just a myth made popular by a famous TV show. In real life, lobsters aren't monogamous at all. Dominant male lobsters mate with several females. And then, one by one, they vanish, only to reappear on a restaurant table with melted butter. Mm. No worries, the animal kingdom still has some hopeless romantics that remain faithful to their mates throughout their lives. Swans, gray wolves, beavers, bald eagles, gibbons, to name a few. You can get warts from handling frogs or toads. What do you think about this rumor? Ah, it's an old myth, probably related to the fact that both toads and frogs have bumps on their skin. Visually, these bumps remind of warts, but they're just glands that never secrete any substances that could cause humans to get warts. There are no amphibians that can give you warts, but shaking hands with another human who has them can. Moving on, turtles live inside their shells, and they can go outdoors anytime. Is it true or false? It's a myth. Those fairy tale and cartoon turtles pop out of their shells whenever they like. But in fact, saying that turtles live inside their shells is like saying that people live inside their own skin. A shell isn't just a separate empty space that serves as a costume. Although turtles can tuck their limbs inside for protection, it's actually an integral part of the turtle's anatomy. Take a look at the actual structure of its skeleton. The shell is fused to the bones of the skeleton, and the turtle can't live without it. The same goes for tortoises. One major key difference between turtles and tortoises is that tortoises spend most of their time on land, while turtles are designed to hang out in the water. That's why turtles have thinner and more water-dynamic shells, and tortoises' shells are more rounded and domed. Next, koalas' fingerprints are indistinguishable from humans. Does this sound realistic? Although it definitely sounds like it's made up, in fact, it's true. If you compare a human fingerprint to a koala's, you'd hardly be able to tell the difference even under a microscope. When scientists made this discovery, they warned the police because these fluffy little cuties are really capable of confusing forensics at crime scenes. The smart guys suppose that the koala's fingertip features have recently improved independently in their evolutionary history. Koalas' relatives, like kangaroos and wombats, don't have the same features. Koalas probably develop these complicated fingerprints because they help them grip onto leaves and branches more easily. Koalas are known as super fussy eaters. In fact, they prefer eucalyptus leaves of a particular age. Mm. Their sensitive fingers may have evolved as a tool to spot out the right leaves by their texture. Koalas aren't the only mammals with human-like fingerprints, by the way. Finger patterns of chimps and gorillas are also pretty complex. Ready to move on to the next rumor? 
Ostriches put their heads in the sand to hide from predators. Myth or true? What do you say? Nah, it's just a myth. Ostriches don't stick their heads in the sand when threatened. In fact, these guys don't bury their heads whatsoever. This myth has spread, thanks to that famous idiom, to hide one's head in the sand. In real life, ostriches have to dig holes in the sand for their eggs because they're flightless birds. To make sure they're evenly heated, ostriches put their heads in there to rotate the eggs from time to time. But ostriches still have some escaping mentality. When they face some threat, they can flop to the sand and stay perfectly still, pretending they aren't alive. Goldfish can't remember anything for longer than a second. Hmm, can it really be that bad? If you often say you have a goldfish memory as an excuse for forgetting something important, I have some bad news for you. Multiple studies have proven that goldfish can remember things for several months, if not more. Scientists from an Israeli university held the cutest experiment. For one month, they turned on classical music while feeding the fish. They believe that this practice would teach the fish to associate the melody with food. In five months, after the end of that training period, the fish still got excited and started looking for food every time they heard the music piece that had played earlier. Ah, Mozart! Hey, where's my food? It's not clear exactly where this myth came from or why it's so popular. But some people suggest that goldfish owners started it as they felt guilty about keeping their pets in tiny bowls. Cats and dogs are colorblind. Any thoughts on this one? Well, that's not true. Cats and dogs have much better color vision than we thought. This myth is probably just an exaggeration of the fact that each animal perceives colors differently than people. Studies reveal that both cats and dogs can see in green and blue. They also have more light-sensing cells in their eyes, also known as rods, than humans do. It means that cats and dogs can see way better in low light spaces. Dogs' eyes have fewer cones, those color-sensing cells. That's why scientists believe that dogs' approximate color vision is only about one-seventh as vibrant as humans. Sharks can only breathe and stay alive when they swim. Does this one sound real to you? According to a popular misbelief, sharks can breathe only while moving because swimming helps them push water over their gills. Although many kinds of sharks are designed this way, Many others, like bottom-dwelling nurse sharks, don't need swimming to pump oxygen-rich water over their gills. Meanwhile, all sharks do lack swim bladders, so if they stop swimming, they'll probably sink to the bottom. But luckily, a shark's body can't be compressed. That's why rapid descents or ascents are safe for them. Sea otters hold hands so they don't drift apart while sleeping. Can you believe that? Yep, it's true. You can keep awing at it, but in fact, this way of sleeping has a practical purpose for them. Scientists suggest that sea otters develop this cute habit to stay close with their mating partners. If you hold your otter girlfriend's hand tightly all night, it will reduce the risk of her mating with another male while you're sleeping. Shameless. Also, holding hands helps otters to protect themselves from predators because they stay away from the land altogether. Now, if a human touches a bird nestling, its mother will abandon it. Myth or truth? What do you think? Luckily, it's just a myth. In fact, parent birds don't recognize their younglings by smell. So, feel free to put the cuties back in the nest. And always hang on to your otter girlfriend so you won't get eaten. Good advice. You're walking down the street and hear a familiar buzzing. You're so scared, you sweat and stop. The next second, you notice a yellow beetle with black stripes. The smell of your sweat attracted this bug. It's like nectar to it. No worries, though. It can't bite you. The only thing this bug can do is lick you. And no, it's not a bee. This is a hoverfly, a kind of flies. Unlike bees, bumblebees, and wasps, It's harmless, but this is not the only reason why. You shouldn't squish it. Hoverflies pollinate plants around them, just like bees. They are crucial for nature's life cycle. The larvae of these beetles are indispensable helpers in any garden. They feed on aphids and other flower pests. When still a larva, 
one hoverfly can eat about 400 aphids. Imagine how many parasites thousands of larvae can destroy. These kind and harmless insects have no chance of resisting their enemies, birds and predatory insects. So they developed an amazing deceptive way of protection. Hoverflies are actors in the world of bugs. They learned to mimic the appearance of bees and wasps, to instill fear in those who want to eat them. Many animals and insects know how painful a wasp can bite, so they are wary of them. When a spider, a mantis, or a bird notices hoverflies, they are afraid to approach because they think it's a bee. But appearance alone is not enough, so these amazing flies can move like bees. Some species imitate a bite, flying towards the enemy, pretending they have a bee sting. Some hoverflies also raise their front paws above their heads to make them look like bees' antennas. Their behavior is sending a clear message to prospective enemies. Don't get closer. I'm a wasp, and I'm going to sting you. But the coolest thing about rare types of hoverflies is their annoying hum. They make a sound resembling the buzzing of bees and scare away foes more effectively. Bees don't fight hoverflies. They pollinate flowers together and drink nectar. So don't squish it. It's not going to do you any bad. By the way, even if a bee or a wasp are flying nearby, don't try to hit them. Most likely, you won't catch them with the first hit, which will make the bugs angry. Just be calm, and the bee will fly away. Another insect you shouldn't crush is the ladybug. First, it's beautiful, and it can be yellow, orange, red, gray, and black. Not all of them have spots. Second, it doesn't pose any danger to you. But the main reason to keep ladybugs safe is that they feed on aphids and many other soft-bodied insect pests. So they can be a great help in the garden. The green lacewing is a tiny, fragile insect with transparent wings that resembles a miniature alligator because of its green color. Adult lacewings aren't that useful. They feed on nectar and make your garden more beautiful with their good looks. But at an earlier stage of life, these insects are effective aphid exterminators. That's why lacewings larvae are called aphid lions. They also eat ticks and eggs of other insect pests. Bees are considered to be the most useful bugs in the world. According to some studies, they pollinate about 80% of fruits, vegetables, grains, and nuts in the U.S. In one day, one bee can pollinate a huge number of flowers and trees. They also produce honey. According to research, honey is a product with an unlimited shelf life. Scientists have discovered an ancient Egyptian tomb and found plates with edible honey in there. Bees are absolutely necessary for our planet. About a third of the world's food production requires bee pollination. Cows eat vegetation that bees pollinate. And if there were no bees, it would greatly affect the health of all the world's cattle. A lot of fruits and berries would lose their taste if the bees stopped fertilizing them. We get most of the cotton on the planet thanks to pollination by these insects. There would be a shortage of genes if the bees disappeared. The taste of many products would deteriorate, and the food would likely lose its useful properties. So, think twice before swatting at a bee. These bugs look like huge mosquitoes. They have long paws and a thin proboscis. Don't squish them. They are crane flies, some of the most harmless and gentle insects on the planet. They mostly live near water and close to large vegetation in moist places. They don't bite anyone with their long proboscis, but use it to feed on the plant's nectar. Some species don't have a mouth and proboscis at all. They don't eat anything and live a short life. They use fat reserves they have accumulated while they were larvae. Some people believe if you see this insect, it's a sign the frosts are over and spring will come soon. You shouldn't catch them because they are an important element in nature. Many frogs, birds, spiders, fish, and insects feed on crane flies. It's better to let a crane fly be someone's lunch than crush it. A house centipede is a pretty terrifying insect to encounter. This long creature with 15 pairs of long legs can live in your bathroom or even bedroom. But don't touch it. A centipede is a helpful neighbor. It preys on small insect pests, controls the population of cockroaches, midges, flies, termites, and other bugs. A centipede won't appear in your house just like that. It comes only if there's some crawling food for it in the room. You can squish it and relax for a while, but then small pests will arrive at your house. 
If you give a centipede a chance, it will destroy all unwanted guests and leave. These creatures are solitary predators and won't start a colony or build a nest on your bed. They don't carry any diseases either. And of course, they won't be the first to attack you. Most likely, they'll just run away if you scare them. By the way, they run fast. Other friendly but scary looking neighbors you might have are spiders. They catch bed bugs, mosquitoes, flies, and other small insects. If you have a black widow or some other poisonous species in your house, it's better to call a pest control service to get rid of those monsters. Mantises are quite helpful creatures. They hunt insects that spoil your flowers and do it so effectively. They can exterminate entire colonies. They can control the population of some bugs. Many people buy mantises and release them in their gardens. A brown marmorated stink bug isn't helpful or too friendly, so you'd better not touch it. These bugs emit an awful smell when they sense any danger. Squishing them has the same effect. This is a pretty effective way to defend against enemies for these creatures. Stink bugs are pests and aren't welcome in any home. To get rid of them, use a vacuum cleaner or a bowl of soapy water. Throw a bug there and the soap will stop the unpleasant smell and minimize damage to your smell receptors. Earwigs are not as nasty as you might think. And no, they don't crawl into your ears to lay eggs there. This is a common myth that turned them into dangerous enemies for many people. In reality, they're your friends and helpers. Earwigs have forceps, but they use them for defense, not attack. Don't touch this insect if you see it in your garden, because it helps to dispose of rotten leaves, herbs, and plants. Earwigs are scavengers. If you found them in your apartment, then carefully use a piece of paper to throw it outside. You're unlikely to see peacock spiders in your house because they live in the forests of Australia. But if you happen to run into one, don't try to squish it. These tiny creatures are the size of a grain of rice. They are poisonous, but their jaws can't bite through human skin. So they are harmless. They have a multicolored pattern similar to peacocks. They use it not to scare some enemies, but to attract female spiders. They dance to mate and have offspring. In total, there are about 50 species of peacock spiders, and they all dance differently. They lift their buttocks, shake them, and tap their paws on the floor. They are some of the cutest spiders in the world. They belong to the jump spiders family, which means they don't spin webs. Instead, they stalk their prey like a leopard, then jump on it and inject venom. They can attack a prey three times bigger than their size. Polar bears aren't at all white. Their skin is black under the fur. They need the white color to disguise themselves while on the hunt. The color black absorbs the sun better than any other, while white fur doesn't stop sunlight. Rays pass right through it. In a sense, a polar bear has transparent fur. There's a myth that dogs and cats see the world in black and white. In reality, they just can't distinguish some colors. Nobody knows how exactly dogs see. Some think they only distinguish two colors. Could be blue and yellow, for all we know. But they can see shades of other colors better than people. And cats have wonderful night vision. They need about seven times less light than a human to see in the dark. Now, giraffes were thought to be mute. But recently, it's been found that they make low-frequency sounds at night to communicate with each other. During the day, they don't say a word and warn each other of danger in a very unusual way by moving their well-developed eyebrows. It's likely that at night, it's difficult to see the eyebrows, so they start talking for real. While we're on the topic of giraffes, these animals sleep much more than 30 minutes a day, but probably not as much as you do. Their sleeping pattern is quite typical. After researchers monitored a herd of giraffes, they found out they slept at night and took short naps in the afternoon. In total, each giraffe had around 5 hours of sleep every day. Oh, and by the way, a herd of these guys is actually known as a tower of giraffes. Makes sense with the long necks. Seagulls can drink seawater. There are salt-secreting glands near their eyes. These glands purify seawater very quickly, and the salty residue comes out through the nostrils. Yep, you guessed it, salty snot. The Adelie penguins are real romantics. They only have one partner for life. The male must give a smooth stone to the female to create a family. You could say that's kind of an engagement ring. Like humans, though, 
a female penguin may refuse and not accept the ring. Hmm. Speaking of animal love, foxes are romantic too. Male foxes are good fathers and husbands. They're devoted to their loved ones for life. They look after the females and even pick fleas from their fur. Ah, Male foxes improve their whole houses and take an active part in their baby's upbringing. Dolphins can sleep with one eye closed and the other one open. Half of the brain dreams and rests, yes. and the second half closely monitors the environment for signs of danger. The perfect brain for sleeping during boring classes and meetings. Hey, I didn't say that. Besides, dolphins manually control their breathing. They can simply drown if their whole brain is sleeping. Sea otters are the cutest sleepers among all animals. In the summer, because of the heat, sea otters spend all the time in water. They swim on their backs and sleep in that position. The babies are sleeping on their mother's stomach, and two adults hold each other by the paws so that they're not carried apart by water currents. Ostriches don't stick their heads in the sand when threatened. In fact, these guys don't bury their heads at all. This myth has spread thanks to that famous idiom to hide one's head in the sand. In real life, ostriches have to dig holes in the sand for their eggs because they're flightless birds. To make sure they're evenly heated, ostriches put their heads in there to rotate the eggs from time to time. But ostriches still have some escaping mentality. When they face some threat, they can flop to the sand and stay perfectly still, pretending they aren't alive. Now, according to a popular misbelief, sharks can breathe only while moving because swimming helps them push water over their gills. Although many kinds of sharks are designed this way, many others, like bottom-dwelling nurse sharks, don't need swimming to pump oxygen-rich water over their gills. Meanwhile, all sharks do lack swim bladders, so if they stop swimming, they'll probably sink to the bottom. But luckily, a shark's body can't be compressed. That's why rapid descents or ascents are safe for them. Scientists from Japan played audio recordings for cats to prove they're truly dismissive. In those recordings, the owners of the cats called them by their names. Cats' pupils dilated, the animals moved their tails, legs, or ears. Cats heard people, but rarely responded. It's all about evolution. Cats came to people because they were attracted by mice that ate grains. They lived close to people, but were never tame. And yet, we keep feeding them. Birds are actually the only surviving dinosaurs. They evolved from theropods, the dinosaurs that ran on two legs. Yep, T. rex is a distant relative of chickens, ostriches, and even hummingbirds. In reality, flamingos are white. The bird turns pink due to beta-carotene. This pigment is found in the algae and the shrimp that it feeds on. You can change your color too. If you eat a lot of carrots, your skin will turn slightly orange. This will happen because of the high beta-carotene content in the vegetable. Sailors from all over the world talked about the giant squid they met on their voyages. For many years, scientists considered monsters with long tentacles to be a myth. But in 2004, the first photo of a giant squid was taken. They actually exist. Scientists have registered an animal that has grown to 43 feet. Mosquitoes actually bite some people more than others. The most delicious humans are those with type O blood. Also, these insects have really good eyesight. They're attracted by green, black, and red colors. So check the color of your clothes before you go camping. Whew, you're in the heart of the Sahara Desert. You're going to take part in a marathon. From this point, you need to walk 600 miles east to the meeting point. You want to prove to yourself that you can survive in any conditions. Open sea, the icy lands of Antarctica, the Amazon jungle. You've been everywhere. And now it's the turn of the hot desert. The key to success in any journey is preparation. You take a large backpack filled with necessary stuff. A small hatchet for chopping off dry branches. A compass, a sleeping bag. You can't rely on GPS, as the connection may be lost in the desert. Matches, a first aid kit, water purification tablets, a flashlight. Also, you need a scarf, a bandana, sealed glasses that will protect your eyes from sand, and light clothing that can cover your entire body. A raincoat or a tent will also be useful. You need all this to protect your body from sand and sunlight. For the same reason, you pack gloves, too. You can't eat highly nutritious food. To digest it, your body needs a lot of energy and liquid, and those are the most important and sparse things in the desert. 
Diet bars or dried fruits are great options. Also, you need a lot of water. A lot of water. It's safer to take several smaller bottles than one large container. If this container gets damaged, you'll be left without water. And when you have several bottles, you reduce this risk. The backpack is filled and you're ready to start your journey. A helicopter takes you to the middle of the desert. First of all, you lubricate your nostrils with a moisturizing cream. This is necessary to prevent the mucous membranes from drying. Hot air can burn your nose, and you can't breathe through your mouth not to lose valuable moisture. You walk a few feet and stop. It would be a mistake to travel through such a hot place during the day. You'll start sweating and lose a lot of liquid, but your water reserves are limited. The ideal time for traveling is in the evening and during the night. At this time, it gets cold. You'll need to move more to keep warm. So you find an old fallen tree and tie an awning to it. You've created a shadow, which means your sleeping spot is ready. It's important to move as little as possible to save your energy. You open the map and pull out your compass. Then you check the route, look around, and study the desert landscape so you can navigate it more easily. You want to drink some water, but you stop yourself. It's better not to drink for 24 hours to make your body go into survival mode. You close your eyes and fall asleep. Sand is blowing in your face. You get up and see a sandstorm approaching you. The tree near which you've been sleeping seems too fragile. It won't withstand the storm. You urgently need some shelter. You put on your glasses, tie the scarf around your head, and moisten it to make breathing easier. If you didn't have a scarf, you'd need to cover your face with your hands. All parts of your body must be protected with clothing. Tiny grains of sand collide with your skin at great speed. Despite the protection, you feel some of them on your face. There is no shelter where you can hide nearby. It could be a large stone, a tree, but nothing. Now you need to find a hill. During the storm, the grains not only fly but also bounce off the ground and one another. When you're on a hill, most sand grains fall down its slopes, and you remain more or less unscathed. You need to get to high ground as soon as possible, since it's hard to move in such conditions. You're losing too much energy. You even have to walk backward with your back turned to the wind to protect your face. The storm is getting stronger, but fortunately, you're already rising. You find yourself on a small sandy hill. You wrap your tent around your body and wait. Tired, you fall asleep again. A couple of hours pass. You open your eyes and hear silence. The storm is over. You remove the tent, shake off the sand, and inspect the territory. The evening is getting closer. The sun is no longer warm. You take out the compass with a map to check the route. But in the next moment, you find out the sandstorm has completely changed the surrounding landscape. It's difficult to navigate using the map when there are no familiar landmarks. You can easily stray off course and get lost. So you're not sure where to go. But you have water and food, and other people know approximately your location. In this case, it's better for you to stay where you are. They will start looking for you and, eventually, find you. You won't waste your energy and reserves, but you look at the compass, at the map, and decide to go east. You're here to complete the marathon, whatever it takes. The night is quite cold, but constant movement helps you stay warm. You check your pockets and find out that you've lost your matches during the storm. Then you see a dry tree ahead. You chop off some of its branches and tie them to your backpack. While walking, you leave markers on the sand. Those are branches with pieces of cloth tied to them stuck in the ground. This way, you can help rescuers find you if you don't get to the meeting point. It's dawn. The sun is scorching. You find another tree, create a shade using the tent, drink some water, and fall asleep. At night, you cut off the branches of the tree and again wander through the desert. It seems that you're lost. Your water is running out faster than planned. You're snacking on an energy bar, and your body demands even more water. The most important thing in this situation is to stay calm. Fear drains your energy. You try to imagine the desert as your home, and you know it perfectly. This gives you strength and confidence. You find the ruins of an old building and hide in its shadow. After that, you put the branches in one pile and set them on fire with a mirror. You need the fire so that rescuers notice the smoke. Unfortunately, there's no helicopter flying in the sky. 
you continue on your way the next night and discover that only one bottle of water is left. You try to eat as little as possible so that your body doesn't waste energy on digesting food. It makes you weaker. Now your goal is to replenish your supplies. To do this, you need to wait for dawn. Then you'll look at the sky, find the clouds, and go in that direction. Where there are clouds, there should be life and water. But very soon, you understand that the sun is too hot. You make a shadow again. Exhausted, you lie down and quickly fall asleep. The sun has changed its position and is now shining straight on you. Its heat wakes you up. You don't have any water left. You get up and look for some rocks or vegetation. You can get some liquid from grass, plants, or bushes. After rains, moisture remains under stones for a long time. Pick them up and check, but carefully. Scorpion snakes and spiders can hide there. Also, you need to look at the sand to find some animal or insect traces. Animals always go toward water sources, and you need to follow them. But be very attentive. Those can be traces of cheetahs or African wild dogs. You're too weak to defend yourself against them. You need to spot the animals from afar and wait for them to drink first. You find some footprints. A group of spotted hyenas is walking in the distance. You slowly follow them. They lead you to an oasis. You wait for a couple of hours for them to get enough to drink. Finally, they leave the place, and you can quench your thirst. Don't forget to throw purification tablets into the water. But even if you don't have them, you should drink anyway. In any case, it can't get any worse. Also, it's important not to drink a lot at once. Your body is exhausted and can't process a lot of liquid quickly. You drink slowly, in small sips. It feels as if you can do this for hours. Then, you eat and pour some water into your bottles. No longer hungry, feeling satisfied and happy, you fall asleep again. Some noise wakes you up. A helicopter! It's flying right over you! You scream and wave your hands, but the rescuers don't notice you. It's too late to make a fire. The helicopter is leaving! Think, think, you take out the mirror, catch a sunbeam, and direct it at the helicopter. Ah, the rescuers have noticed you! You're saved. If you think your folks were too harsh on you, perhaps this list of negligent animals will show you a broader perspective on bad parenting. Female horses, or mares, have a gestation period of about a year. This might sound like a terribly long time, but elephants won't agree with that. They carry their young for up to 22 months before giving birth. Unlike the other animals who prefer to rest waiting for their cub to arrive, for mares, pregnancy means party time! The moment the female horse gets pregnant, she goes for a walk around the herd and mates with every stallion. Although it seems meaningless because she's already pregnant, there's a reasonable explanation. The male horses are pretty proud and aggressive with their rivals. But if a stallion would think that a brand new foal is his, the chances that he will hurt the youngling will fall to zero. So the mare's actual intention is to keep the foal safe by making it impossible for stallions to determine the real father, which is a good mothering quality. That's why mares are at the bottom of our list. Female cuckoo birds are famous for abandoning their chicks before even hatching. They simply lay eggs in other birds' nests and leave for good. It's hard to distinguish native eggs from foundlings. That's why the unlucky foster birds incubate them all equally. Meanwhile, cuckoo birds even enjoy their single independent lives. Unfortunately, it's not a win-win deal. The cuckoo chick brings chaos and losses to the foster parents. It grows faster and hatches earlier, making the smaller purebred chicks fall out of the nest. Sparrows are so cute, but don't buy into this innocent little face. A female house sparrow is a good, caring mom, but also a furious stepmother, who might terrify even Cinderella. Sparrows are typically monogamous, but sometimes they can have connections outside the native nest. When it happens, a female sparrow can literally figure out the other women that mated with their partner and destroy their nests. Why? Just to make sure the male sparrow will have enough time to father her own offspring. Apparently, they haven't heard of babysitters. Harp seals are dedicated to their pups during the first two weeks, so they can't be called the worst mothers in the animal kingdom. 
In this short period, they keep their offspring close, nursing and feeding them round the clock. But after that, mother seals say goodbye and leave the younger generation alone on the ice. Seal pups are still very vulnerable because they don't know how to swim, hunt, or protect themselves. They should be at least two months old to learn all those skills. So they spend this time waiting, losing weight, and trying not to get eaten by predators. It's no wonder that only one third of all little seals actually make it through the first year of life. Hamsters are harmless, cuddly, and cute, right? But still, they have one dark secret that can shock their owners if no one warns them. In some cases, hamster females may confuse their own offspring with dinner. Nobody knows exactly why, but scientists have developed several theories. Some suggest that they're trying to replenish nutrients after giving birth. Others claim that mother hamsters might feel stressed and threatened by too large a litter. So this action is a self-protection mechanism in a way. To avoid this sad ending, experts recommend keeping the mother hamster away from any stress and giving her all necessary nutrients. All or nothing is probably the favorite motto of black bears. They usually have two or three cubs at a time. But if a mother bear only has one cub for some reason, she's likely to abandon it, hoping for a larger litter the next year. Why? Probably because raising only one baby isn't worth the effort. That's a strange kind of laziness. And while a black bear cub may increase the chances of survival by having a sibling, pandas follow the opposite tradition. It's hard to admit, but these cute fluffy fellows are pretty negligent parents. Panda mothers usually have twins, but they prefer taking care of only one of them. They will feed and nurse the strongest cub. Meanwhile, the weakest one will be neglected and forced to survive on its own. The explanation for their cruelty is pretty practical. Pandas eat bamboo, but it's not nutritious enough to make milk for both cubs. Even pandas that live in the zoo follow the same tradition of abandonment. But thankfully, zookeepers provide all the cubs with milk equally. Although monkeys usually have the reputation of caring, responsible parents, these little mustache cuties stand out. After a gestation period of around five months, the mother tamarind usually gives birth to twins. And if they happen to fall out of the tree by mistake, she will have the nerve to ignore her own cubs crying. Mm. Some of them can throw the cubs out of the tree voluntarily for unknown reasons. Who knows what hides in those little heads? But not all of them are so cold-hearted. If a mother tamarind is surrounded by a wide social group of strong food providers and protectors, she's likely to take good care of her offspring. But when no one's watching or helping, she can stop making any effort, probably because the cubs won't have a high chance of survival anyway. Although mustached tamarinds look like great pet material, experts claim that these monkeys require more daily commitment and dedication than any other pet. Well, at least you're too heavy to kick out of the tree. Bunnies are usually associated with warm hugs and cuddles. But in real life, they're not so gentle when it comes to their own newborns. Rabbit mothers prefer leaving the burrow as soon as they give birth. And these cute little bunnies have to learn to face life challenges on their own. They only interact with their mother for a few minutes a day during feedings. Scientists suggest that the female rabbit abandons her offspring to confuse predators and keep them away. Of course, this method doesn't provide a 100% guarantee. After all, the rabbit mothers don't put much effort into creating a safe shelter for the cubs. They usually build it out in the open. And where's the happy father, I hear you ask? Well, it's recommended to isolate the mother from any male rabbits while she raises the newborns. Unlike the horses, male rabbits will probably not hurt the younglings, but he can impregnate the female rabbit again, even on the same day she gives birth. Reptiles aren't known for being warm and caring creatures, and their practical approach to life extends to their parenting style as well. But long-tailed skinks bring personal boundaries protection to the next level. This mother lizard will eat her own eggs when too many predators gather around her home. She won't make any effort to fight off the danger, 
perhaps her philosophy is, if I can't have it, no one will. After the threat is gone, they'll just live on and lay new eggs. The female eagle lays two to three eggs within a week. After around a month of the breeding period, the eaglets finally emerge, but their problems are only getting started. Technically, all eggs have slightly different ages, so they don't hatch simultaneously. And when it comes to sibling competition, black eagles can get pretty aggressive towards younger chicks. The older chicks usually start to peck the younger before they even get the chance to start their lives, probably to reduce the competition for food and space. But the eagle mommy won't bother to pull apart her chicks, even if their fight leads to serious injuries. She would neither scold the winner nor save the loser. Apparently, her indifferent attitude should prepare the chicks for the harsh life of an adult eagle. After all, it's a bird of prey, and it keeps the habit of hunting mammals and other birds at their nests throughout life. Now, sloths can hold their breath longer than dolphins. Yep, incredible but true. They slow their heart rate so much they can stay under the surface for up to 40 minutes. Unlike fish, dolphins and whales are aquatic mammals, which means they can't breathe underwater. When it comes to breathing, they're more similar to us than the fish. Both of them have lungs, and they breathe air through something we know as a blowhole. When they're under the surface, they hold their breath until they come up for some air again. Dolphins can stay under the water for 10 minutes. A sperm whale can hold its breath for 90 minutes, while an elephant seal holds the record when it comes to aquatic mammals and can stay under the water for 2 hours without having to go up. There's a wasp so tiny, much tinier than its name, it's smaller than an amoeba, even though amoebas are made of one cell only. You can see this wasp has the same body parts as the rest of the bugs – wings, brain, eyes, and the rest – but it's really a tiny version of an insect since it's only eight thousandths of an inch long. And the smallest adult insect we know of is a parasitic wasp with a big name, also known as the fairy fly. Their males don't have wings, they're blind and only five thousandths of an inch long. Now, it's no coincidence each animal species has different colors and patterns. One of the reasons for that is to help them stand out when looking for their potential mating partners or to send a warning to predators they're poisonous and hope they get the message right. Then there are ambush predators, such as tigers. It's very important for them to remain invisible because the difference is huge. If their prey sees them before they get there, no dinner that night. But why exactly are tigers orange? For us, orange is a color used for things that need to be ultra-visible. For example, items such as safety vests or traffic cones. To the human eye, orange will mostly stand out in the environment. So if there's a tiger coming for you, you'll spot it relatively easily. But humans have so-called trichromatic color vision. When light from your surroundings enters your eye, it hits the retina, a thin layer located in the back. To process that light, the retina uses two kinds of light receptors, rods and cones. Rods can only distinguish differences in light and darkness. They can't sense color. Our eyes will mostly rely on rods in dim light. Cones are in charge of color perception. Humans mostly have three types. Cones for green, blue, and red. That's exactly why we call our vision trichromatic. Most humans see three primary colors, together with their colorful combinations. Apes and some monkeys also have such a style of vision. But most mammals that live on land, including cats, horses, deer, and dogs, have dichromatic color vision. Retinas in their eyes have cones for two colors only, green and blue. When humans get information from their green and blue cones only, they're considered colorblind since they can't, for example, tell the difference between green and red shades. This is similar with mammals that live on land. Deer are surely tiger's prey way more than humans, and deer don't see tigers as orange, but green. Green tigers would surely be more difficult to spot, which would mean more dinner for tigers. But evolution still decided to go with orange because it's simply easier to produce such a color. The only green mammal is a sloth, but its fur is not naturally green. It's because of the algae that grows in it, and they can hold their breath for 40 minutes. The water around the poles can get very cold during certain periods of the year. 
There's plenty of fish that live there, but when that happens, they need to swim away to survive. But there's a special group of fish native to the Southern Ocean near Antarctica. The temperatures there are from 28 to 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Technically, that's below freezing, but all those dissolved salts in the seawater don't allow it to freeze over. And these fish can survive because they have a special feature called glycoprotein. It helps them stay in their home because it acts as sort of a natural antifreeze. It's a protein that prevents all those ice crystals from forming in their blood and helps it continue to flow normally. Have you ever wondered how tiny animals like ants breathe? Try to open your mouth and throat, but at the same time, hold your chest and diaphragm still. The diaphragm is a muscular structure that separates the chest and abdominal cavities in all mammals. It expands as you breathe. If you can't do this, you can't hold your breath, because oxygen will still find its way into your lungs. At least, enough of it to keep up with your body's demands. But generally, when you breathe, diaphragm is actively pumping air in and out of your body. To survive without the diaphragm doing so, you'd need more than one throat and a way smaller body. Now, ants have 9 or 10 pairs of openings along the sides of their tiny bodies. They're called spiracles, and each is connected to branching series of tubes. It's a system similar to human lungs. Their blood doesn't carry oxygen from those tubes to the rest of the body. Instead, the tubes spread this oxygen. The endings of these branches directly touch the membranes of their cells. This can only work in really small animals. When the body is bigger than 8 tenths of an inch, these tubes are too long, so they can't diffuse air fast enough. There are a couple of reasons why giraffes have long necks, which, by the way, can grow up to be 6.5 feet long. From first glance, it seems evolution gave them those to reach the sweetest topmost leaves of the trees. It's exclusive access other animals can only dream of. So giraffes don't have to compete for the best bites. But over time, researchers realized it's not the only reason. They also think the neck could be a good factor when male giraffes go into combat. The same as male antelopes will use their prongs or when a stag uses its antlers. The thicker the neck, the bigger the chances to win the combat. Some insects play possum when there's a predator nearby. For instance, in one research, Scientists have observed an antlion larva insect. It played possum for 61 minutes. How does this even help? Well, let's say you're in a garden where you see a bunch of identical bushes with soft fruit. You go to the first bush and start collecting and eating fruits. Mmm, yummy! It's so simple! And you're doing it relatively fast. But as you strip that bush, it's getting harder for you to find more fruits. Plus, it's kind of irritating because it takes way more time now than at the beginning. So now you need to decide whether to stay there and try to find more, or simply switch to another bush to have it all easy and fast once again. Assuming you are the predator, and predators are greedy, you'll just look for ways to eat as much fruit as possible in the shortest period of time. This means you'll go on and start collecting fruits from another bush, and the next one, and so on. Researchers use the same logic when it comes to bird and antlion larvae. It appears that insects waste the predator's time when playing possum, which has a significant impact on how things go later. That way, they encourage the predator to look for food elsewhere, because the predator doesn't have that much time to waste. So, pretending to be not alive is actually a good way to stay alive. Depending on the species, young birds spend from 10 to 30 days in their eggs. There's no air inside, but Mother Nature created a perfect mechanism for them to still be able to breathe. As a young chick is developing inside the egg, it grows some kind of hollow sac-like structure from the gut. It's like a tiny pouch that fuses with a second membrane that goes around the chick and its yolk. So, one end is attached to the chick, while the other is close to the inner surface of the eggshell. That way, this special membrane acts like lung tissue and connects the outside world with the chick's circulatory system. Most animals have two eyes, but some species need more. For example, some reptiles, amphibians, and fish have a third eye on top of the head. It's not something that improves their vision that much. 
but it simply helps them navigate via the sunlight and regulate their body temperature. Many invertebrates have more than two eyes. Most spiders have eight of them, because that way they can spot their prey easier. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.